Hey everybody, this is Greg Penix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Penixonian Institute of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to look at Marvel Premiere number 32, featuring Monarch Starstalker. And uh, this comic came out in 1976, which is kind of odd, because if you look at this logo... Um, you would totally think that this came out after Star Wars was trying to cash in on the whole science fiction boom, which many comics did after 1977. This comes out a full year before, and strangely enough, it's drawn by the same man who drew the very first uh, six-issue story arc of the Star Wars comic about a year later. This comic is a lot better. Um, this is a great little science fiction comic. I love this comic as a kid. It was one of those comics where it definitely shone, uh, shined uh, way more than the average comic. You know, most comics were assembly line product. Um, they get some hack writer, um, some artist who was just trying to meet his deadlines. There was no heart and soul put on the page. They were just telling stupid superhero comics uh, stories. And, you know, this is what I grew up reading for the most part. But then every now and then something like this would come out with uh, someone who gives a fuck. And Howard Chicken was one of those guys who gave a fuck. He, all the comics that he did, he never really drew Spider-Man or the Fantastic Four. He didn't want to. So somehow he found a niche in that mainstream comic world uh, in the 70s to do his own kind of idiosyncratic personal work. Even though he had the Comics Code Authority to deal with and uh, editorial nincompoops at Marvel and DC where he worked. But he's still somehow like... Uh, auteur-like. He uh, put out some great stuff. I guess I should comment on the cover. It's kind of obvious they got someone to ink heavily over Chicken. This is, you know, I think this is Chicken's layout. So it has the dynamism. Uh, Howard Chicken was a great graphic designer. He was really good at uh, designing covers and characters. But um, it looks very, they got a very strong anchor to give it a more typical Marvel comic sheen, I guess. But it's still a pretty nice cover, especially back then, you know, definitely stood out. It wasn't just two superheroes beating each other up. And uh, here's the first page. Stanley presents Monarch Starstalker. Stanley had nothing to do with this at all, but that was what they used to do back then. Um, it's got a pretty cool logo. I believe it's by Annette Kowecki. She's the letter of this comic. But it's just like a decent little sci-fi story um, introducing this interesting character who I wish went on to do more. So they're on this little icy planet and it's um, kind of like a, this planet tried to revolt against the, the Empire, if you will. But um, it's not really the Empire. It's, it's pretty much just like a conglomerate of corporations run everything. But these guys were kind of rebels. They're like a mining planet. But they failed, so they're kind of bitter. So this guy from that, uh, you know, conglomerate concern is coming to smooth over the ruffled feathers, maybe. Offer these guys a deal. So as soon as he gets in, they realize he's who he is, and they just start fucking with him. They grab his girl, but then all of a sudden, in a great splash page, Monarch Starstalker shows up. Now he is there just to, he's a bounty hunter. And, um, but he also, I guess, you know, has a, he's got a heart of gold because, you know, he doesn't like seeing this woman being bullied and, uh, manhandled by these thugs. So he beats the shit out of them. Just beautiful chicken, typical of the time. Just really well designed. De definitely his own style, you know? It's not like anyone else was drawing like Howard Chicken. But here's some of his good design work, you know? doing these interesting panel layouts. And, uh, well, I guess I should comment, you know, editing Archie Goodwin, one of the most people claim as the best editor comics ever had. So I'm sure Archie Goodwin just let Howard Chaykin have this nice little one shot, let him do what he wanted to do. And you can tell it's better than most comics of the time. And they even got Glynis Wine on colors as the colorist. Like I said, calligraphy, it's Annette Kowicki and Jim Novak. I, it's weird how I wonder back then if colorists and letterers could pick their own assignments. There's so much for them to do. They could turn down stuff. Because certain great letterers like Annette Kowecki and great colorists like Glynis Wine always seem to pop up on the best comics back then. Almost as if they 
didn't have to, you know, letter the latest hacky comic. Like all the great stuff in the 70s, Kill Raven, um, uh, Black Panther by Don McGregor, uh, you know, Howard the Duck. It seemed like they always had the best letterer and colorist, which almost makes me think that they had better good taste and they were like, yeah, if I'm going to letter something, I want to letter something good. So it's not as boring. So uh, really nice colors in this. Uh, just deep, deep colors here. I like this deep blues they have. It's just, it's not like a um, typical superhero comic, which is all bright primaries. You know, I guess to attract little kids. This is more muted um, with what they can do on newsprint uh, color back then. It's pretty damn good. So there's, you know, it's not really much of a story, but he, he says that he's he's there for a bounty on this guy, Kurt Hammer. Sounds like a real psycho. In the bar, the local bar, I think there's one bar in the whole city. He meets this woman and uh, she takes a shine to him. Of course, there's some more action. Some of these uh, towny guys, you know, don't like the way he uh, roughed up their fellow townies in the earlier scene. As you can see, lots of ads. I couldn't rip them out because there's all hard on the other pages. So some great Howard Chicken action. Just really great poses. I mean, Howard Chicken grew up reading like all these great adventure comic strips and stuff. Just really nice stuff. So he goes home with, a, I, th I believe her name is Ms. Goodfriend. And uh, tells him tells her his, uh, his origin story. I guess I should, I forgot to mention, this is kind of crucial to Monarch Starstalker. As you can see, this little android raven or falcon is always with him. I should have pointed that out earlier. That's kind of part of his whole, I guess kind of his superpower, if you will. So she asked him about the raven. Um, I'm sorry, Falcon. He says, that's an odd choice for a pet. He's like, oh, he's far more than a pet. He was uh, basically on a starship. His whole nervous system was wired into the navigating system. Uh, something went wrong. His whole nervous system was kind of incinerated, leaving him with no senses, no memory. But luckily, you know, they were just going to let him die. He wouldn't have much of a life. He'd be a vegetable. But they hooked him up with this android Falcon, Ulysses. And it's an artificial nervous system telepathically linked to him. So basically without that falcon, it'd kind of be like a vegetable, you know? It would have no sensory input, no memories. So they get to her house, and pretty soon he puts the make on her. She's really into him. And there we got uh, his android falcon kind of voyeuristically looking on. But of course... As we explained, he couldn't even feel anything if that android pocket wasn't there. This as a kid was really just remarkable to me in a Marvel comic. I mean, for example, Spider-Man, he rarely even kissed his girlfriends, like Mary Jane and Gwen Stacy. It was just these, like, deep loves that were very sexless and passionless. But Howard Chicken is definitely, you know, more of an adult creator. And even though he doesn't show anything, he can't. It's the Comics Code Authority... Uh, you know, you can tell. Yeah, these guys are, they're fucking. They're gonna fuck. Because, of course, the next scene, it cuts away to dawn. It's the morning. They obviously uh, had carnal knowledge of each other. But, um, yeah, that was really weird, 1976, you know? Just like, huh, comics don't ever do that. Marvel and DC, they don't even imply that people make out. You know, they don't even show that. So she goes back into town and do some stuff and, we find Kurt Hammer shows up, the bounty, and he's a regular nut job. And he kidnaps this girl who was traveling with the um, bigwig from the planetary corporate conglomerate or whatever they're called. And um, she rush, a good friend sees this all, rushes back to Monarch Starstalker to say, like, hey, you got to do something. And also Kurt Hammer is there so he can get his bounty. Yeah, Kurt Hammer's a real nut. He's psycho. Just totally kills this guy in cold blood. Doesn't even have to. Doesn't really care. He's just... And then he starts killing everyone in the crowd. Everyone's rooting him on when he kills the bigwig. And then he turns on them and just starts shooting all those supposed friends who think he's a hero for going up against the, the powers that be. 
So Monarch Starstock rides back into the city. Or rides somewhere to find him. It's like, uh, Howard Chicken tries to be, you know, is not, he's a kind of above your average Marvel writer. Dusk, and as the ever-continuing snowflakes fall, they catch the last red rays of a dying sun, swirling like scarlet embers in a frigid fire. So it's a pretty nice panel. Love those reds there. Um, what Glennis Wine could do with newsprint color. It's pretty good. There's the letter page. They mentioned how Wood God is coming up. One of the stupidest Marvel Comics concepts ever. And, uh... You have lots of ads back then. This is the era when there was 17 pages of comic story in a comic out of 32 pages. It kind of sucked. Um, yeah, once again, beautiful colors here. Look at that purples and it's like a sunset, I guess. And um, so Kurt Hammer, turns out this girl was on the inside. She's kind of his lover. and um, But she's worried about this monarch star stalker fellow. She knows his reputation. She's riding... Uh, Kurt Hammer takes a shot at him, kills his horse with some laser rifle or something. And, uh, but he's way too good. He dies behind some rocks. And then his uh, Ulysses uh, does a distraction. And he's going to take him down with shrapnel. And it causes a big avalanche. So Kurt Hammer's all happy. He's all like, yeah, he got caught in that avalanche. But you can't keep a good man down. Monarch Starstalker is one tough motherfucker. He, he was lightly buried in the snow, crawls his way out. And Kurt Hammer. That's a punch. Look at that. That's You can feel that. That guy's not you know, coming back from that. Well, I guess he's not knocked out. He's a, a tough motherfucker, too. But he's basically, you know, Monarch Starstalker's got the gun. And then he says, I'm keeping you alive till we get back to town because you're carrying the girl. I'm not going to carry her. You know, that's your job. So he dies of pneumonia before he gets back. Yeah, Monarch Starstalker, Starstalker says his farewells. It's, it's, he's kind of like that typical silent, cold-hearted hero where the guy says, hey, we could hold the, the spaceship for you so you could go visit your girlfriend one last time. And he's all like, no thanks. You know, no biggie. She'll understand. And that's the last we ever see of Monarch Starstalker. Apparently for 30 years or so. I guess they brought him back during the whole... Uh, when the Guardians of the Galaxy, the current incarnation that we know from the movies, when they were being introduced, they brought back... Uh, they brought back Monarch Starstalker. But I have a feeling it's not the character. Howard Chicken wasn't involved. You know, like any good comic creator, cartoonist... This wouldn't exist without Howard Chaykin. I mean, Monarch Starstalker is not that great a character, but it's the Chaykin sensibility. And over the seven, course of the 70s, we'll be looking at, he kept doing this. Howard Chaykin kept creating these great little idiosyncratic characters that were obviously like avatars for him, I think. They were all a little similar. But, you know, some were science fiction, some took place in the 30s. But they all have that distinctive cheek and stamp to them. Unfortunately, most of them didn't last long. Probably because they weren't superheroes. And that's all kids really seemed to want back then. But this is a nice little comic. Um, I don't know if it's expensive now, but I always found this in quarter bins, uh, you know, growing up. And nobody gave a shit about it. And I think I bought it a few times just to give to friends. I was like, such a great comic? You know, back then there weren't that many great comics. They definitely upped the game in the 80s and 90s. But yeah, that's a Marvel premiere number 32, Monarch Starstalker. I, when I was a kid, I just would read this over and over and just hope and pray that there'd be a, another one. But there never was. And uh, in 1976, I guess I was like nine years old. And I thought this was like the height of what comics could do. I thought this was amazing. But um, yeah, of course, looking back, it's not so great, but it's a pretty damn good example of a decent Marvel comic. Well, not decent. Back then, it was an exemplary Marvel comic. Okay, hope you liked it. And uh, we'll be back soon with some uh, more comic goodness. And thanks for joining us. Have a good night.